Welcome back to Guard Beardia. This is Guard Bro. I just woke up. It is uh, early, <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna be a bit weird. But uh, thank you for coming back to the channel of Guard Beardia. I have for you Chapter Nine of the second volume of the Veil Riders, and then. Next month will be two chapters of the Emily Bronze series. Additionally, we want to talk about our affiliates. We are affiliated with Redcon 1, the place where you go to get all your protein, pre-workout, fat burner, muscle builder, gamer fuel, glucose disposal. They, if you need it, they have it all. And it's all in one nice little tidy package, fun packaging, and it's just a good thing to have in your system, whether it's just a protein or the waterboard natural diuretic if you need it. But what they have is probably what you need. So get in there, get some protein at least, and get them gains while you're working out your body. Our other affiliate is Skull Splitter Dice, who just released their June dice packs uh, Warriors Might, A Lot of the Faithful, Song Shards, The Force Familiar, and many more. They also have good sets of uh, metal dice, brass, steel, all that kind of like ant. My, my favorite is the, is the antique brass one because they're heavy as shit. If you put the antique brass dice set in a sock, you can kill someone with it. <laughs> They also have steampunk dice, wizard based dice, a skull mug to hold your dice. They have all kinds of fun colors and fun sets that you just might need. Because we all know that all folks who like this kind of stuff and uh, like D&D and tabletop games are all fucking dice goblins. So they have the fix for your dice goblin needs. Just hop on in there, grab you a set, and just enjoy the ride. But most of all... We have a very special guest lending her voice to a very special role. Today we have Likely joining us in the voice actor role. She is Best Dragon, and there are no substitutes. But I know what you're here for. You're here for the story and the content of the Veil vale Rider. So let's go ahead and get into it. So I give you Chapter 9, Unconventional Tactics. You'll observe the siege golem slowly slinking backwards into the portal, leaving behind their wounded and dying that lay in droves towards the trench approach. They had gotten close, extremely close, to getting in the trenches thanks to the golems throwing their shields and digging them into the ground as a place to run for cover. Their war casters had also thrown up a thick fog at one point, and without the support of the mortars, they had gotten within 50 feet of the trench. Casualties were light, but casualties all the same. A few were struck by throwing spears, others by arrows, while a few fell victim to offensive spells. Yeth has found little to do with all the members of the healing corps running around, and instead said prayers to the field of bodies before them, her cooling Daewoo K2 hissing beside her on the grass. First Sergeant Arenda Kane sat nearby, drinking messily from a canteen and flexing her blood-covered hand. Arenda had been busy dueling with the Alterac warcasters that had gotten close to the trench, even having to cheat a few times by drawing her sidearm. A bullet ripped through their body and ended their spell when they got the magic she didn't know how to handle on the fly. Their respite was only possible by the desperate actions of the Iron Rain Battery, the few crucial rounds expended by them turning the tide just enough to cause a mass rout back towards the Long Portal. The city of Tallwheat was relatively unscathed, with only a few buildings trailing tendrils of smoke into the sky. Yule set down the radio receiver on his knee and sighed, then looked down at the map splayed out on his other leg. Thankfully, Wolf had managed to quickly rally a few humans in a half-track, running it straight towards the battery to help them out with a puma in tow, but it was only quick enough to avoid the loss of the battery's remnant crew. 
Yule still had no idea just where the hell those enemy troops had slipped in, as neither flank reported any kind of actual contact beyond taking pot shots at random skirmishers. Yule figured it was more magical fuckery, and he wrinkled his nose at the thought. Human tactical warfare was straightforward with rigorous rules and reality. There was no zipping around due to magic or hidden portals. If you wanted to be somewhere, you had to either walk or catch a ride. This new information caused him to pull in some elements of his flanks to patrol the city proper and set up checkpoints along the roads. That way, there was no easy avenue to sneak into the city and wreak havoc. Even now, he could hear the random shots and crackles of machine gun fire from the city of Tallweed as his auxiliaries hunted down any remaining elements of the Alterac forces. Yule began making more radio calls to NCOs on the flanks of his modified wedge, plucking and picking anything they had to spare and placing them in strategic places within the city. When he was satisfied after an hour of radio calls, he stood, folded up his map, and leaned his chest against the trench, resting his arms on the edge and his chin on his forearms. The enemy casualties were immense, and Yule had never seen so many bodies laying on the ground at once. In some locations, they lay in mounds, infantry dying over infantry as they tried to close the distance. One of the felled golems had curled around on itself, managing to safe keep a bundle of wounded that were later extracted on their retreat out. The golem lay there still, unmoving, left behind by those it protected. Yule chewed on the inside of his lip as he surveyed the shattered lines and ranks. If he had to reckon, at least 5,000 men and women lay dead out in the grass, but that was still only a fraction of what the Alterax had to offer in comparison to him. His final dead count, from those who could not be saved by the Healer Corps, only numbered 40 in total. Most of those dead came from Iron Rain, as many of their wounded expired of their injuries due to the lack of medical assistance. The thought made Yule grimace, as even in a world of healers and potions, they were still no use if not applied in a timely manner. Behind him, on the approach into the city, harpies were resting and chatting about the skirmishing they'd been accomplishing all the while. Savarus had been wanting to not be outdone by the fighting on the trench line, and had been constantly launching raiding attacks on the main encampment of the opposing army. Not only that, but Chickaly, Eris, and other lighter harpies had managed to take pictures of the camp with their leg cameras during the chaos, which fed valuable information to Gremlin once they returned with their rustic film rolls. The film was obnoxiously touchy, requiring a dark room and chemical baths, but digital cameras were still leagues away and these photo rolls were just barely usable thanks to the efforts of the Brim Touch clans. Yule became aware outside of his thoughts that all the harpies had stopped talking, and he looked up and around behind him, seeing that they were all staring up into the sky without saying a word. Yule squinted at them, then up into the sky, but a warning call from down the trench made him look back to the ground. A fog was rolling in, a magical fog like before if he had to reckon, and the radios crackled to life as everyone got ready for another attack. As the fog rolled in and weapons were charged, everyone watched the faint glow of the portal in the background where it had stood since its advance was stopped waiting for the telltale pulse that meant the arrival of enemy troops. Minutes dragged by, and no pulse came, leading some to ask on the radio if it was some kind of trick. When the fog was at its thickest, one of the harpies gave a cry, and they all took off at once to the safety of the city. You watched them go, rifle in hand as the rest of the auxiliaries beside him looked back and forth between the city and the fog-covered portal. He turned back around towards the fog-covered battlefield and waited, watching for whatever this was supposed to be obscuring. A shocked hiss came from a brim touch beside him, and the auxiliary trooper clutched a medallion hung around his throat. What is it? Yule asked, watching the brim touch closely. The brim touch was clenching the medallion so hard his skin creaked on it from detention, and he looked up at Yule with terror in his eyes. It's... she's coming. The cadaver queen. Don't call her that. A dwarf machine gunner nearby growled, a lit pipe in his mouth and a tankard of field ale in his hand. Treat Brumola with the respect she desires. She is a bad omen. The brim touch whispered, 
pulling down the bill of his patrol cap as he began to recite prayers. The dwarf shook his head, taking a pull from his mug without even taking the pipe from his lips. He smacked his mouth, then looked at Yule through his thick and shaggy brows. She is not a bad omen. Brumola clears great battlefields of worthy warriors and carries their souls to the resting grounds. To be chosen by her is an honor. The brim touch said nothing more, too deep into his prayers to respond, and Yul blinked, not sure what to say. The fog grew around them, churning over them like a cloud fallen from the sky. Soon it became hard to see anything, even if it was only a few feet away. Yule waited, patiently, watching the battlefield before him. He was rewarded with a great boom from high above. Yule slowly looked up, along with the dwarf and the brim touched beside him, to see a great shadowy figure coming down from the sky, the wings of which dwarfed the buildings that stood behind the trench. The boom came again, and Yule realized it was the sound of this figure, Brumola, beating their wings. Around her swirled more small figures, and you were surprised to see they were in fact other harpies. One came down to land in front of the trench, and Yule nodded to it slightly while the brim touch recoiled in horror, shrugging down beneath the trench as if to hide from it. Raven Harpy, it's her. Oh fuck it sir, it's Bramola. He muttered, now holding his medallion with both hands. In comparison, the dwarf, who was able to see over the trench edge thanks to the clever construction of his machine gun position, spoke to the harpy in Dwarf Ha, a more lyrical form of dwarvish. The dwarf then bowed his head and held his fists together, knuckle to knuckle, and the raven harpy bowed her head in return. Then she spoke in Dwarf Ha back to him, and Yule found it to be the weirdest fucking thing he had ever heard. Harpies did not usually speak any language beside Tunka and Harpish, and when they did speak Tunka, it shared the same grammatical structure as Harpish itself. This time, however, the Raven Harpy spoke in fluent, soft dwarf ha, huh? devoid of the usual accent. The Raven Harpy then looked over at Yule with cold, brisk intelligence in her gray eyes. Yule said nothing but gave a little wave. The raven harpy snorted and flew away, eliciting a laugh from the dwarf. The laugh was cut short by Brumola touching down to the surface of the battlefield, and the ground shook with her arrival. As far as Yule could tell, Brumola was a harpy that had to be at least 16, 17 feet tall on her head, and her eyes radiated a glowing crimson in the gloom. She stalked slowly along the battlefield, her eyes casting here and there as she sought for those who she saw as worthy dead. Around her, raven harpies flew and landed here and there as well, checking over bodies for whatever they may find themselves. A pair of them had a body held aloft by their talons, one on each arm, and Yule watched as they flew over and laid the body down near the trench some feet away, the fog churning under their wing beats and allowing Yule to track their progress. A cry for a medic was heard, and the wounded enemy was dragged down into the trench for treatment. This was done several times by the raven harpies as they plucked and picked out the wounded they saw worthy of living and the auxiliaries of Cosmling Company took them without complaint. In the distance, Yule saw Brumola kick over the dead golem and inspect around him, and after a pause, moved on, stalking her way along the portal. The glow from the portal gave her an eerie outline, as if a shadow was slowly walking across a movie screen. Yule was able to make out the outline of the armor she wore, as well as the regal crown that rested upon her head. Her profile flickered and traced along the lightning gloom, a lightly pointed nose and full lips the only real features visible due to the lack of light, and her hair appeared to be braided in multiple thick strands that ran off her head in rivers. Only one body was borne aloft by her wing talons, the figure visibly backlit by the portal, and she pressed the figure against her forehead. The figure vanished trailing away into the fog itself, and she halted her search along the battlefield. She turned and began to stride towards the trench, and Yule heard the actions of multiple weapon systems get ready. Hold your fire! Do not fire! Yule roared, picking up a handful of spent brass and throwing it down the trench line. No one fire their fucking weapons! 
A brim touch nearly depressed the trigger on a belcher and had to be tackled by nearby troopers and restrained. The brim touched in general did not seem too keen on Brumola, but most were more afraid of what would happen if they disobeyed Yule's order. The ground shuddered as the massive harpy got closer, and Yule was able to track her progress as she stepped lively over the trench and into the city itself. The light shaking in the creak of armor came from her step, and Yule had to assume she was walking about and flying in full battle rattle. He hopped out of the trench and began to run after her, dogging her footsteps the entire way through tall wheat. Raven harpies landed along the rooftops or even nearby as he ran watching him in curiosity as he chased after the mighty being, but none made moves to stand in his way. The fog continued to boil and roll along with her, and Yule ended up stumbling over some debris from an errant spell and eating shit on the cobblestones, but that didn't stop him from his chase. Brumola slowed her pace as she approached the KIA collection area, and she stopped, leaning down over the gathering of bodies. Her braids hung down around her face, and it reminded Yule of Spanish moss hanging down from trees. They softly drifted back and forth from the slight breeze. The soft shush of her breath and the gentle click and clack of hair beats could be heard. Yule skidded to a stop a few yards away, closer than ever now to the giant harpy, and her eyes drifted over to him, their cherry red glow scattering in the fog. Now that Yule was here, he realized he wasn't even sure why he ran after her. To see his men away? To make sure they were treated fairly and handled carefully? Yule stood there before her sight, awkwardly breathing in lungfuls of breath and oozing blood from a cut on his cheek and forehead thanks to the cobblestones. Brumola slowly swished a wing, the wind buffeting Yule and causing him to almost lose his patrol cap again. But the fog cleared a little, and Yule could see just what he was up against. Brumola was a massive warbird, bearing wing claws and talons that were encased in long, elegant sheaths of steel. The sheaths were adorned with masterful etchings of battle, of armies clashing, of mighty ships warring at sea, and of bodies heaped up and upon each other like mountains. Her armor was done in the same beautiful style, and not a single steel face of her protective surfaces were devoid of the etchings. With the swish of her wing, she had cleared a direct line of sight from herself to Yule, and she locked her bare eyes onto his, and Yule's legs gave a shiver. Brumola was a haunting visage, her face ghostly pale and sculpted in a horrifyingly beautiful way. Her hair was the same black-blue color of her feathers, and the beads she wore in between the sections of her braids were not glass, but bone. Her face was grim, but curious as she looked at Yule, and he thought she had the air of a businesswoman who was just here to do a job. He puffed out a breath as fear gripped him, urging him to come to his senses and run away from the giant harpy, but he couldn't. Not without seeing off the dead. Brumola turned her eyes back to the corpses below, their forms covered with cadaver sheets, and paid Yule no more mind as the fog began to roll back in around her. Those auxiliaries who had been hiding nearby ran over to Yule once he had been exposed from the fog for the brief moment, and they stood panting next to him. What is she doing? A female Yamantu medical sergeant asked, her hands stained red by blood she hadn't the time to wash away. Yule shrugged his shoulders listlessly as he watched, judging them, I guess. The small cluster of Cosmoline Company troopers and Yule washed on as Brumola reached down with her long and deadly wing claws, only to slowly pinch and move the cadaver sheets aside, exposing the face of the body underneath. When she saw what she needed to see, she would either move the sheet back into place or gently lift the body up and away from its sheet, holding it aloft just as she did the single body from the battlefield. The great harpy would close her eyes and touch the body to her forehead, and the limp form would drift away into tendrils of fog, nothing remaining of their mortal shell, uniform and all. Brumola repeated this seven times from the KIA auxiliary troopers, and once she was satisfied, she spared one more gaze at Yule, 
then to each of the troopers standing around. With a great thunderous opening of her wings, she launched into the sky from her stooping crouch and beat her wings, knocking over anyone who was standing in the path of the air wave, but leaving the cadaver blankets undisturbed. Raven Harpies took off with her, though some stayed behind, stalking along the rooftops or observing those below. The booming tones of her wing beats grew faint until none were heard at all. As Yule got back up with his troopers, he slapped his patrol cap on his thigh and coughed, while those around him chatted nervously about what they had just witnessed. A voice perked up from the clearing fog in greeting, and Yule cocked his head, slowly turning around to face the unfamiliar but familiar voice. My, you don't see that very often. The fog ebbed away, and before Yule stood a woman in a well-worn World War II German field uniform, a plaid scarf wrapped expertly around her neck. Her mouth held a grim, thin grin as she looked at Yule, and a pale blonde reptilian scale glinted in the light under her left eye. Her hair was blonde, almost white, and was tidily done in Dutch braids that ended in a bun at the back of her head. Her face bore many long white scars here and there, but her haunting violet eyes told of the countless battles she had witnessed where her scars could not. She was Fay. Yule knew that immediately, and his hand gripped both his pistol and the handle of his gold fleck gore knife, but something made him pause. The rage of Cringe was burning inside his chest, coiling and lashing out the mere sight of the Fae standing in front of him, but still Yule did not move as he watched the dark shapes walk out from the fog behind her. The Fae's leather trench coat fluttered at the hem as human soldiers bearing the uniforms of American infantry walked out from the fog behind her, their hands resting easy on their issued M1 carbines, Garands, BARs, and a pair of them had 30 cal machine guns on their shoulders. Next to the American infantry were just as many German Panzer Grenadiers, their gray field pants clashing strongly with their fleck tarn uniform tops and webbing. These humans carried Car 98 bolt action rifles, STG 44s, MP 40s, and a handful of FG 42s. No matter what uniform they wore, they all bore the same kind of patch on their shoulders. A shield with the head of a red fox in the center of it, while behind it a black diamond formed the backdrop. As she spoke, her accent was thickly German, but she spoke the English words evenly, and her grim grin spread out to a fang smile. Wow, wow, wow. What do we have here? Sturmgeschütz with dwarven gunners, pumas with arms manning the wheel, and humans running around in the shot of a Hawaiian vacation? How strange, and how fun. Yule's Oni radio operator swallowed nervously as he looked from Yule to the Fey in front of him on the other side of the table, then to the small company of human soldiers who loitered nearby with the rest of the human elements of Cosmoline Company. There had been a long lull between charges from the portal, and the flanks were quiet as well, the Alterac forces having withdrawn. When the humans heard of the arrival of the mysterious band, as well as Yule meeting with a fey commander in the ruffled magpie, they all descended in mass to both pepper the veil-bound humans with questions, as well as buy them drinks. Alavara and Makarat sat on the other side of Yule, both of them happily digging into a meal with carbon-stained fingers smudging their utensils. While they were curious about the new humans and their fey leader, they were more interested in eating as quickly as they could, while they could. Olivar also took the time to snuggle up next to Yule despite his rather sour demeanor. All in all, Olivar was having a doozy of a day. She almost melted the barrel of her M240 Bravo, got to see a battlefield god, and chicks had taught her a card game. The Germanic Fae finished off her second tanker to veil with a contented sigh then placed her hand in the middle of the third that sat nearby ready for departure. Yule leaned forward as she did this, his chair creaking as he rested his elbows on the top of the table and laced his fingers together. The Fae looked at him with a level eye, 
While the rest of the World War II era infantry cheered in the background at the news that the war had indeed come to an end in their absence. Her eyes leveled on Yule as she could feel the waves of unerring hatred wafting off of him like cologne and she waited. Yule's eyes flicked towards the bar where grizzled veterans of the European campaign mingled with their modern counterparts, then back to the Fey. Did you kidnap them? Yule asked. And the door to the end opened as First Sergeant Arenda King stepped through, taking off her patrol cap and taking one of the spare seats next to the Oni radio operator with smooth ease. The Fey exhaled out her nose in a sigh of laughter, and her fingers drummed on the cold mug. You seem to be implying that I have the power to do so. You're Fey. You have magic. You replied. And Arenda leaned back in her chair, observing the other humans. As far as she could see, they were a content and happy lot despite their scars, and she didn't smell or feel any kind of fey magic coming off of them. Fey magic, in her opinion, smelled harshly of cloves and holly, and was hard to miss. Arenda shrugged. No magic to be found here. Not on them, anyway. The fey gestured with her free hand. See? They follow me willingly, just as they did through the wall. With these words, the other humans in the inn turned around and looked at the back of the Fey's head, while the humans of another age chuckled, nudging their counterparts with elbows. Yule raised his head an inch while narrowing an eye slightly. What do you mean, just as they did through the war? The Fey smiled. The second big one, of course. Who are you? Yule said in a low tone, and both Olivara and Makara looked over as they sipped from their own mugs, their fingers leaving black smudges on the glass. Normally tall wheat use wooden or clay mugs, but glass mugs are being bought by the crate as the orders arrive from New Sanrion. You know me by another face, more than likely, just as your kind have always known the Draconics by a face not their own. In your time, I'm sure you knew me as a man. A man named... Erwin Rommel, she said, and the humans not familiar with her at the bar inhaled sharply at the name. A confused smile broke Yule's lips, and a rough exhale of a short laugh left him as he took in the name. <laughs> that, no, that's impossible. Erwin Rommel died. They made him commit suicide in a staff car. The fey woman held up a finger politely. Ah, but... You see, the Erwin Rommel did not die in that stuff car. Ah, Erwin Rommel died and was then buried afterwards with full military honors. But not Erwin Rommel. Let me tell you what really happened that day in the warm German sun. As the Fey woman spoke, taking time to sip at her mug of ale, Yule's hand slowly came down from his face onto the tabletop and the other humans who had not heard the tale crowded around, their eyes on the fey draconic as she spoke. The tale began with her sitting in the same staff car that she was supposed to have died in, after it had been found out that she had been helping with the plot to assassinate the then leader of Nazi Germany. She was annoyed, having been found out, but she hated the magic addled mind of the human anyway. He had ruined a perfectly good war due to barbarism, having found out some of the Fey's secrets, and had been attempting to gain that power himself. This, of course, would have never worked, and why it didn't work despite all the blood he gathered during his genocides. I had enjoyed performing as Erwin Rommel. Warfare really took off at the lightning speed, and playing at another grand war with you humans would be the peak of my career, as far as I was concerned. You see, in the very beginning, when we had crossed over the first time with the Queen, we had found that the place we invaded was in fact inhabited by you, Irvin said, and she held up her hand, asking for another round of three ales. I don't understand, Yule said, and the rest of the modern humans around the table nodded in agreement. Ah, it stood me light. I should explain. We had lost the war here. So we retreated to a place to lick our wounds. It was an odd spell, one I had never heard of before. But the queen had broken the barriers between two worlds in an attempt to gain an upper hand of sorts. There, on earth, we found new species in its infancy, and we saw potential. You humans are mildly resistant to magic, 
but we were bloodthirsty, quick to war with each other, and had an aptitude for combat in all shapes and forms. The other Fae found you to be abhorrent little savages, but we, mechanics, couldn't help but fall in love with you. She took a swig from her third ale as the three others were set down beside her. When did you arrive? You asked, and Irvin burped softly. In your Bronze Age. From there we began to culture you, use you to advance weaponry in order to take back home in the end. You humans were so terribly good at war that we Draconics began to practice it with you, serving amongst you or leading you in one way or another. Many of your ancient heroes were more than likely one of us, or a human pupil by us. When our face would grow old, or die in combat, we would simply choose a new name and a new face. It was so much fun that we just had to keep the good times rolling. Irvin drained the rest of her third ale, set it on the other side of her with the rest of the empties, and wrapped her hand around the fourth. I think that is where the trouble started, really. We became attached to you, almost as if you were our students or our children. When the second great war started, we did not like how the other greater fae were meddling in it for their own political reasons and sought to stop it. Unfortunately, that did not go as planned, as it turned out the true conspiracy was using old Adolf to reopen the portal forcefully, despite the Queen's orders. No one knew that there was actually a Draconic as Erwin, and I had found the sporadic way opening a few days beforehand in the Schwarzwald. It was very moody, always popping up in random places and hiding from us, and caused the Queen much headache with its mischief. Yule closed his eyes as if pained. You... Faye used us for... what? Weapon development? Irvin shrugged. More or less. How did you survive the staff car, though? Chix asked, leaning in around Grouch with a bottle of wine. Irvin chuckled. <laughs> when I was alone with Burgdorf, I used a little magic to freeze both him and the two men who had stepped out. I left the car and waved over my loyal foxes, and they had the replacement Erwin with them. I do feel bad for the man. But he was a straight doppelganger of me, and was the actual father of my wife's children. There were times when I went into the mountains for a month or two and let him take over my duties, and not on campaign. That way he got to see his children. I don't have the correct equipment despite the magic, you see. Everyone but you laughed, and he motioned for her to continue. Irvin took a sip of her fourth ale and talked on. As the replacement Erwin took the pill and died in the car, the rest of us made our way to the way. My Panzer Grenadiers would have been killed if they had gone back, and I could see the writing on the walls when it came to the inner political nature of the unseely court. I wanted out, and I wanted a break. At the same time, I could not leave my men to their deaths. You humans had ruined that for me over the millennia, and each time I lost humans I trained or fought beside. It began raiding on me, like puppets tossed into a bucket. After time, all of we Draconics felt the same and began to draw away. What about the American troopers? Yule asked, and pointed to a sergeant who was talking with Wolf about how Soda had changed through the years. The sergeant raised his chin in greeting and smiled. Ah, hell. Irvin was helping us win the war the entire time. She came to us one night or bivouac asking for volunteers to make sure she and her men made it safely to the forest, and we were curious about seeing a magical world. Shoot, the war sucked. We were tired. Plus, we just rotated out of Aachen. Irvin saved us a lot of dead men on multiple occasions. The least we could do is rustle up some single volunteers who didn't mind their family back home getting an insurance payment. Yule stared at the sergeant, eyebrows brought together in a quizzical look, but dragged his eyes back to Irvin. And then, you've just been hanging out here the entire time? No. We've been in hiding, to be frank. Humans don't last long in the open, and we had no way of knowing if any other greater fae were here. Anytime we had to get supplies, I would pay locusts to bring them to the edge of our forest hideout, slowly burning through my stash of gold. We haven't been here long, actually. I'm sure you're aware of the time difference. We became aware of it, yes. Yule replied. 
Are you aware you broke it? Irvin murmured and drained half of her mug. Broke it? Yul shouted, and the rest of the humans looked around at each other. From what I heard from an old friend on the other side of the battlefield, when you collapse the way, the way itself has been out of sorts and hard to control. According to him, you're the fast side now compared to how it used to be. Not by much, but noticeably all the same. She took another sip of ale and cleared her throat. Anyway, I came down to give you back your humans. I do not wish to lose any of them under my own command, and I will outlive them regardless. This way, they are back with their fellow rust bloods and not trapped with some stinky little fae in the woods anymore. The older era humans all chuckled and another American spoke up. Oh come on, Rommel. You smell like fresh spring daisies in the morning. If they were in a dead horse, maybe. Quipped one of the Panzer Grenadiers, and everyone laughed again as Irwin leaned her head back and barked back a reply. Do you know how much soap costs? Everyone but you laughed again, and he leaned back in his chair, running his hand down his face and beard. Alright, so I fold in these old bloods. What are you going to do then? Irvin smiled slyly. Well, I can't be allowed to run around spilling all your secrets or helping the enemy with my wily fey magic. So you have to either kill me or... You rolled his eyes as he crossed his arms. Every fiber in his being wanted to plunge his knife into this fey woman, but she had safeguarded a precious amount of humans in an already human depleted world. Plus he knew if he tried to kill her, he would have to contend with all the humans she had saved in the first place, and these veterans looked as grizzled as his own. What do you want then, Faye? Just to hang out and enjoy the show. Irvin said with a polite smile, and Olivara laughed dryly beside him. When Yule looked over at her, she held out her hands. What? She's funny! Arinda held up her hand slightly from her own crossed arms. And the Draconics are more or less the elite foot soldiers of the Greater Fae, being two faces of bitter gall to their kind, despite their blood ties to the rest of the brood. I mean, she kept these lads alive. That should say enough. Yeah, Yule. I mean, these guys probably know a few things Gremlin doesn't. Chick said. And some of the older era humans shared a glance that said, I don't know anything special, do you? Yule rubbed at his nose with the back of his fingers with a sniff inside. Cringe's feelings were quite known to him, but even she could see the reason, and her white-hot rage had dulled in his chest. He looked up at Irvin, then reached over, taking the last of her ales in his hand and holding it up to her. You are welcomed as a guest to my cosmic company, Crystal Fox. Irvin guffawed and clanged her mug against Yule's, while the rest of the humans cheered. Ah. Come on now, that was some good chocolate. Olivara patted Yule on the forearm, as if saying it was going to be okay, while on the other side of him, his only radio operator held his hand to a single earpiece. He turned to Yule, handing the human the receiver. Yule, the right flank is being probed, but Captain Fathidas says there's modern armor. There's also another wave coming from the front trench line. Yule took the receiver and stood, gesturing towards the humans in the inn. Finish your drinks. The second act is about to begin. And you. He gestured towards Irvin, who had crossed her legs in a relaxed manner. We're not done yet. I have more questions. Irvin smiled cheekily, her fangs glinting in the lights of the dining room, and she raised her mug towards him in salute. Yule stepped out of the ruffled magpie to the pop and echo of gunfire on his left flank, and the corner of his mouth twitched. Olivara stepped out behind him, giving him a quick kiss on the cheek before running after Makarat and Chicks, who were making their way back to the building they had occupied previously. The majority of the humans left the inn at a trot, the newly acquired humans jogging along with their floral shirt compatriots who filled them in on the go. They did not have a lot of ammo for some of the weapons the older era humans had brought with them, and would be instead issued the Veil Rider standard for long rifles. Kentucky sauntered out, watching Alavar and the others run off to war, and she chuckled with a click of her tongue. <laughs> so, we just letting Faye live now, eh? Yule growled in his throat, 
his eyes tracking a supply truck revving down the road. The only reason why it is alive is because it safeguarded humans. It also tried to kill Hitler, so it can't be that evil. Kentucky tilted her head a fraction as she observed you. Why are you calling her it? If she's gonna be around us, you may want to use her proper gender. That thing used to be Erwin Rommel. How do we know that's even its real face? You last. While beside him, his Oni radio operator was scribbling down in the notepad while listening to a message. Maybe you just have to trust her. I mean, we at least know how she behaved as Rommel. For the Fae, it all must be a stage play to some degree, so it's hard to tell whether or not she's genuine. Kentucky mused, spitting a wad of saliva down onto the cobblestones. Yule's mouth twitched again, and he put his hands in his pockets, his replacement Daewoo K2 hanging on his chest. It had been a rather busy day for him, almost getting crushed due to magic, getting flanked in his own safety zone, big bird lady, Erwin Rommel being a chick. It all seemed so ho-hum in the first hours of his day. Well, fine. I'll call Irvin her for now. But if she pops on a male face, I'm going to lose my shit. That's the spirit. Kentucky grunted and lit up a hand-rolled cigarette, the match cupped in her hands. Yule sniffed and shook his head. Are you really going to smoke that white feather stuff right now? You may have to go into a gunfight here in a few minutes. Oh, calm down, you boomer. It helps me mellow out. Kentucky said and punched Yule lightly in the shoulder. Right. Nothing helps a soldier during a firefight like being hella fated. Yule said with a wry grin, but Kentucky was fast in the draw. Worked in Nam, didn't it? We lost that one, remember? Yule said, and looked over at his radio operator's pad as the Oni held it towards him. No, no, no. We didn't lose. We got tired of playing in the sandbox and took our toys home. Kentucky said with a waggle of the finger and took a long drag of the cigarette, puffing pink-tinted smoke out of her nose. Are you sure she said that, Riozo? Yul asked, and held the pad of paper in his hand, having lightly pulled it away from Neoni. Yes, sir. Captain Fadira said there were five of them. One took a hit from a stug and had to be abandoned, but the others managed to damage two stugs and two pumas while withdrawing. Riozo said, and he held his finger to his earpiece. Yul flexed his eyebrows upwards. Yeah, a stabilized auto cannon will do that. Do you have Fadithus? I do, sir. Give me the receiver. Riozo handed Yule the receiver, and he gave Kentucky the thumbs up as she had gestured that she was leaving. By the door, Irvin was watching Yule with an appreciative smile, then watched Kentucky as she jogged away. Irvin sniffed, set down her ale tanker, then took off after Kentucky at a run. Yule went to yell at the fate to stay put, but then growled pressing the actuator for the receiver. War daddy to big queen, how copy. And that's the end of this chapter of the Veil Riders, and I am fucking exhausted. <laughs> if you like this video and others like them, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel of Garbeardia. Click the bell icon so you know when the video gets released through the week, but we know how that works and you barely ever get the, I the alert anyway, but just click the bell so it's easier, I guess. If you really, really like the story, you do have a coffee link down below where you can donate. Most of the channel's income is via donations, and it helps keep the channel running. It helps keep the voice actors paid. Speaking of voice actors, if you have a voice actor in mind you like the most, and you want to donate purely to them, you can do that. Just when you do your coffee donation, say, hey, this is for so-and-so, and they'll get the entire donation. I won't take anything, because that's how I roll. But, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story. Be sure to check out our affiliates at Redcon 1 and Skull Splitter Dice. That was Aristic. That was Korra. That was the Bell Dam. That was Lyquee. And this is Garbeardia.